Irene Cara was an American singer and actress who rose to prominence for her role as Coco Hernandez in the 1980s musical film Fame and for recording the film's title song Fame, which went number one in several countries. And I know you guys have heard this song by then. I was forced to sing it in my middle school choir almost every year. And in 1983, Cara co-wrote and sang the song Flashdance, What a Feeling. And that is another song that you guys know that is very, very popular. She shared an Academy Award for Best Original Song and won a Grammy Award for Best Female Pop Vocal Performance in 1984. She was the reason behind so many people in the 80s boldly showing their interests in the performing arts. The movie fame started the craze of dance flicks and was one of the OG musicals. Like you see like movies like Step Up and you know all those dance movies. It started with the popularity of this movie. And because of her a lot of schools around the world just globally not just in America started opening a lot of performing arts centers. This movie really just put performing arts on the map okay and so we're giving her her flowers for that she was a huge deal she broke records for having two of her songs be nominated in the same category for best original song and that has never been done before at that time out of nowhere she just seems to disappear from the limelight she was still making music and going on broadway and you know doing theater and stuff like that but just mainstream it just seemed like everyone started to whisper rumors about her and substance use and she was difficult to work with and nobody should work with her. She basically got the Monique treatment, but just way worse. It was just off with her head. This was kind of her life until her sudden passing. So what happened to Irene Cara? In today's video, we will answer the question and dive deep into some other troubles this beauty had with the industry and how they really, really fumbled her. She really could have been one of the greats. She still is one of the greats, so leave some flower emojis in the comments for her. But they really could have took it much, much farther because she was oozing with popularity. She was likable and even globally, like her songs were going number one globally. Do you guys know how difficult that is? If you are into the music industry, etc., a lot of stars can go number one in their countries. Like if they're a UK artist, they go number one in the UK, but it's difficult to go number one in America. It's difficult to go number one in Germany or Japan, etc. But Irene Cara was going number one globally we got to give her her flowers because during that era not only was it more difficult to go number one in that era because you couldn't just drop several versions of a song or packages merch you know stuff like that your music really had to sell there wasn't streaming or anything like that people really had to physically buy your music okay and she was getting people to do that globally so leave some flowers in the comments for her but in this video, as we stated, we are going to see what happened to her. Why did they blackball her? But first, hey friend, welcome to my channel, Korean Allude, where we deep dive and break down the most iconic stars through history. If you're not yet subscribed, please be sure to do so. And if you're already subscribed, please turn on your notification bell so you never miss an upload. Now, without further ado, let's get into this video. But let's start first with her childhood. Irene Cara Escalera, a shining star born and bred in the Bronx, New York City on March 18, 1959, was the youngest of five children in a vibrant multicultural household. She was raised around African-Americans, but she wasn't necessarily an African-American. Her dad, Gaspar Cara, juggled life as a steel factory worker with his past as a saxophonist. Irene got her Puerto Rican roots from her father, who was a full Puerto Rican. Meanwhile, her mom, Luis Escalera, a Cuban-American, worked as a movie theater usher. Growing up with two sisters and two brothers, Irene's home was a melting pot of Afro-Latina heritage. So her family's was, you know, more on the darker side and were considered Afro-Latina. But because she, you know, looked like an African-American, just a lighter skinned African-American, a lot of people would confuse that she was African-American. And this brought on a lot of trouble for her in the earlier years of her career. Well, when she started to really become mainstream, a lot of people started feeling away about that. 
By 1981, Irene Cara had blossomed into a star catching the spotlight with her Afro-Latina identity. In a cover story for Jet Magazine, she boldly addressed the common misconceptions about being Black in America. She said, and I quote, We have a tendency in this country that when we say Black, it automatically means Black Americans. She emphasized her unique blend of Puerto Rican and Cuban-American backgrounds. Despite her clarity, some critics still dared to challenge her identity, with one particular particularly harsh article questioning her roles as a black woman in film and television. Many did not agree with her taking roles from black women, with one journalist writing, and I quote, nearly every role she has had during her short period of popularity in the late 70s and early 80s was as a black woman. She was in effing roots, for goodness sakes. She's Latina, and I don't think she's even Afro-Latina, end quote. These debates would follow Cara throughout her career, sparking mixed reactions from both the Black community and beyond. And I want you guys to comment below your thoughts. Should she have played in roles like Roots? And then also, it did label her as, although she's not African-American, when she later started winning some awards that were breaking records, you would say, for African Americans or Blacks, um, she was labeled the first Black woman to win such and such award. So this even pissed off more African Americans where there was like, no, it should be the first Latina or Latin woman to, but because Latin women already won that award and they wanted to give the honors to Irene Cara, they would just label her as Black. It became a sticky slope. <laughs> And I already know you guys are going to be wild in the comments, so keep it respectful. But comment below your thoughts with that. But Irene Cara was raised around a lot of African Americans. Her influences were pretty much with the African American culture. A lot of her musical influences were that too. But when she was younger, because she was a child star, most of her performances, music, and television appearances were all in Spanish and the Latin community. So she was a Latin child star before becoming a Black one. So a lot of people was wondering, why did you shift? Was it because you were too black for the, the Latin culture? Which at that time, there was a little bit of colorism within the Latin culture where Irene Cara, though she is very light skinned, the Cubans and the Puerto Ricans that were deemed acceptable to be popular on screen were those that looked more like Sofia Vergara or you know what I mean or Jennifer Lopez those were the ones that were more popular if you catch my drift so Irene Cara didn't really fit that bill so many people are saying okay they rejected you over there you weren't becoming as popular over there so you just jumped here because black people also was more willing you know some of them to support a lighter skinned um, woman that looked like it, she was black basically oh it's so tricky and I hate having these conversations but this was unfortunately a dark part of her career which she had to deal with this a lot and she spoke about it a lot and just didn't believe in the division and she considered herself black and she stated in Hollywood they didn't see her as Latina or anything like that. They saw her as a black woman. That's what she was. So she didn't see no issues with playing black roles or winning awards for black as a black woman, etc. That's that. But let's go back to her childhood, okay? At just five years old, Irene was already stepping into the world of dance. Her journey into the limelight kicked off with performances on Spanish language TV, showcasing her talents as a singer and dancer. She graced stages on shows like the original amateur hour singing in Spanish and even appeared on Johnny Carson's The Tonight Show. By 1971, Cara had snagged a spot on PBS The Electric Company as part of the short circus, the show's band marking her presence in its debut season. Irene didn't stop there. She dipped her toes in the recording industry early on, releasing a Spanish language record aimed at the Latin market and an English language Christmas album. She even shared the stage with legends like Stevie Wonder, Sammy Davis Jr. and Roberta Flack in a grand concert tribute to Duke Ellington. Education-wise, Irene honed her craft at the Professional Children's School in Manhattan, setting the stage for her future success. In a 1985 interview with Cosmopolitan, Cara reflected on her unwavering confidence in her path to stardom. She said, and I quote, I don't mean to sound immodest, but I'd never had any doubt that I'd be successful, nor any fear of success. I was raised as a little goddess who was told she would be a star, she declared, and a star she ended became, navigating the complexities of her identity and talent in a career that would leave an incredible mark on the entertainment industry. 
Irene Cara, before she became a household name, kicked off her acting career in the 1970s daytime soap Love of Life as Daisy Allen, but it was her role as Angela in the romance thriller Aaron Loves Angela, followed by her standout performance as the lead in Sparkle, that began turning heads. Television further catapulted her into the spotlight with critically acclaimed roles in Roots, The Next Generation, and Guyana Tragedy, The Story of Jim Jones. Her acting chops didn't go unnoticed. She was listed as one of 12 promising new actors of 1976 by John Willis and snagged the title of top actress in a magazine, Reader's Pulp. Then came Fame in 1980, a film that rocketed Cara to new heights of stardom. Initially brought on board as a dancer, her incredible singing voice caught the attention of the film's producers and screenwriter, which quickly tailored the role of Coco Hernandez for her. This move paid off spectacularly as Cara belted out the title song, Fame, and Out Here On My Own, both earning Academy Award nominations for Best Original Song, a first in Oscar history for two songs from the same film, performed by the same artist to be nominated in the same category. At the Oscar ceremony, Fame won the award for Best Original Song, contributing to the film's soundtrack success as a chart-topping multi-platinum album. Cara's talent was further recognized with Grammy nominations for Best New Artist and Best Female Pop Vocal Performance, and a Golden Globe nod for Best Motion Picture Actress in a Musical. She was held as top new single artist by Billboard and received accolades from Cashbox magazine as most promising female vocalist and top female vocalist. And despite an offer to reprise her role as Coco Hernandez in the famed TV series, Cara chose to concentrate on her music career passing the torch to Erica Gimple. She was also slated to star in the sitcom Irene, alongside seasoned performers like Kay Ballard and Teddy Wilson, as well as up-and-comers Julia Duffy and Keenan Ivory Waynes, but the pilot never made it to air. In 1983, Cara made a cameo as herself in the film DC Cab. Her acting prowess continued to shine through with an Image Award win for Best Actress for her role alongside Diane Carroll and Rosaline Cash in the NBC movie of the week, Sister Sister, and an NAACP Image Award Best Actress nomination for portraying Merle Evers. However, 1983 was also the year Cara reached the pinnacle of her music career with Flashdance, What a Feeling. From the movie Flashdance, which she co-wrote with Giorgio Moroder and Keith Forsey, the song was a global hit, sweeping awards left and right. Cara made history by becoming the first black woman to win an Oscar in a non-acting category and the youngest to receive an Oscar for songwriting. She also bagged the 1984 Grammy Award for Best Female Pop Vocal Performance, the 1984 Golden Globe Award for Best Original Song, and American Music Award for Best R&B Female Artist and Best Pop Single of the Year, cementing her status as a multi-talented superstar. In the mid-80s, Irene Cara kept her star shining bright. She teamed up with Tatum O'Neill for a gritty performance in Certain Fury in 1985. The following year, she showed off her acting chops and busted up, proving she was more than just a sensational singer. But here's where things get a bit quirky. Cara lent her voice to Snow White in an unofficial sequel to Disney's classic Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. This project, titled Happily Ever After and produced by Filmation in 1993, wasn't exactly what you'd call authorized Disney material, but it's a fascinating footnote in her career. That same year, Cara took a dramatic turn portraying Mary Magdalene in a touring production of Jesus Christ Superstar. She shared the stage with Ted Neely, Carl Anderson, and Denise D. Young, adding a rock opera feather to her cap. When it came to her music, Cara was no slouch. She dropped three studio albums that spanned the early, early to late 80s, Anyone Can See in 1982, What a Feeling in 1983, and Charismatic in 1987. Out of these, What a Feeling soared the highest, riding the wave of her flash dance What a Feeling success. But Irene wasn't about to stay boxed into one genre or scene. In 1985, she showcased her diverse talents by joining forces with the Hispanic charity supergroup Hermanos. Here she belted out a solo segment alongside none other than the Spanish opera Titan Placido Domingo. The 90s saw Cara embracing the globe trotter life, touring Europe and Asia, and snagging several dance hits on European charts. Although the US charts seemed a bit indifferent to her new tunes, she didn't let that slow her down. In the mid to late 90s, Cara compiled a collection of Eurodance singles titled
self-titled Precarious 90s, capturing the essence of the era's dance floor vibes. While her chart-topping days in the U.S. might have waned, Cara's international adventures and musical explorations during the 90s showcased her undiminished zeal and versatility as an artist. You'd naturally expect that a young, talented actor and singer like Irene Cara, oozing with charisma and delivering consistently stellar performances, would be swamped with movie offers and a plush recording deal, right? The kind that comes with top-notch producers and songwriters lining up to work on her debut album. But due to some shady dealings, especially when it came to her acting career, that dream scenario was far from her reality. During these years, Irene found herself tangled in a messy legal battle over royalties with network records. She bravely took them to court, suing for a whopping $10 million. This lawsuit stretched out for an excruciating eight years, a battle she eventually won, but not without its scars. Opening up to People Magazine in 2001, Irene shared, and I quote, I'll never be that trusting again, expressing her disillusionment with the industry's professionals she once believed had her back. The outcome of her legal fight saw her awarded $1.5 million by a California jury in 1993, but by then, the rumor mill had taken its toll. All of a sudden, I was hearing stories about how difficult I was to work with, ridiculous rumors about substance use and what a diva I was, Irene recounted. This lawsuit unfortunately put a damper on what was a promising recording career, but there's a deeper layer to why her Hollywood dreams seemed to fizzle out. It wasn't just about being blacklisted, which implied wrongdoing on her part. Hollywood didn't punish Irene Cara, they simply turned their backs on her, leaving her out in the cold and abandoning her. This really just put a damper on just her career and how far she could have went. It was like you just do not, you just cannot get away with suing these, you know, record labels or these companies. Like you just can't. They basically will make you pay because they have so many connections in the industry that even if you win because she won, there's still consequences, you know? It's just terrible. I hate that. And it's unfortunate that this lawsuit happened so long ago. People are still dealing and battling these type of practices even today and still having lawsuits with these labels. And it's just like nothing has changed, which is pretty crazy. But at least now, a lot of stars can be independent if they wanted to and make millions that way and have control over their careers if they wanted to. But back then, there wasn't really that option. If you wanted to make music and share it to the world, you had to deal with these shady practices. Just very unfortunate. Irene Cara's personal life saw its own shares of ups and downs. She married Conrad Paul Misano, a stuntman and film director, on April 13th, 1986 in Los Angeles. Their marriage lasted until 1991 when they decided to part ways. In her later years, Irene made Florida her home, residing in Largo and keeping a secondary address in Newport Ritchie, where her company Caramel Productions was based. Tragically, on November 25th, 2022, at the age of 63, Irene Cara passed away from arteriosclerotic and hypertensive heart disease, compounded by hypercholesterolemia and diabetes in her Florida home. Her passing marked the end of an era for a star whose light shone brightly on stage and screen, despite the shadows cast by the industry she once thrived in. Like I said, leave some flower emojis in the comments for her. Cause she does deserve her flowers. She was a hard worker, okay? No matter what you think or believe, all right? Leave her some flowers. Comment below your thoughts and who else would you guys like to see a video from? If you like the music you're listening to, the link is in the description. I love you guys so much. Thank you for tuning in. Until next time.